Hi, AJ Hartley here, novelist, Shakespeare professor, fan of many things, and I'm going to talk about one of them today, and this is something I haven't really spoken about that much before, except in the context of um, something like Baby Metal's Megitsune song, <coughs> and it's, a, um, it's about Japanese folklore, monsters, ghosts, supernatural phenomena of one kind or another. <clears throat> and this is something that I've been fascinated with for many years, and it's um, something that is uh, finding its way to in, in, into a novel that I'll, I'll probably publish next year. Um, see, depending on how things go. And, and I thought I'd like to talk a little about it, because I know that a lot of people out there are, are interested in... in in Japanese culture and um, and particularly in the in the sort of uh, stranger more paranormal sense of, of things um, these are stories that that uh, I have lived with for a long time some of them and because I, I, I was as a kid I was always fascinated by ghost stories and stories of monsters and strangeness and so on as are lots of kids right and then I started to encounter some of these stories coming from outside my own culture. And I was fascinated both by the things that made these stories feel familiar, right? Elements from, from the story that chimed with the stories that I was used to from my culture. And also those elements that made them different. And I wanted to think about that and talk about it. And, you know, this might be a series. I might do a, a number of these. Or I might not. It kind of depends on whether anybody's watching and anybody cares, uh, which is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Anyway, and I, as a way of introducing this topic and potential series, I thought I would start by telling the story which first got me in, interested in this stuff in the first place. And I can't remember exactly where I first encountered this. It was before I went to Japan. So it was at least, I don't know, 40 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and the story came to me through a collection of short stories called, was published as Kwaidan by an American living in Japan uh, called Lafcadio Hearn, who I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Hearn or, or Han, as he tends to be pronounced in, in Japan, because it's that, that tricky er uh, vowel, which doesn't exist in Japanese, um, was moved to Japan at the tail end of the 19th century. He married uh, a Japanese woman called Setsuko, who uh, I suspect should be getting a lot more credit for a, a lot of the things that, that Hearn subsequently published. Um, and he was one of the first people to sort of export some of this sort of stories of mythology and the supernatural for a Western audience, right? So let me emphasize that first. I'm not speaking here as a Japanese person who's an expert on Japanese culture. That's absolutely not what this is. <clears throat> Nor am I a cultural anthropologist. I'm talking mostly as a storyteller. Um, and... The story that I'm going to tell you is called Mujina, which is problematic of itself, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and I, I, I guess I must have read this story in, in when I was in sixth form, when I was about, I don't know, 18, something like that. Um, I don't know how I found it, but I stumbled on this little collection. This collection was published in, in 1902. 1902, 1904, I think it was 19, 1904. And um, so, you know, these things are over a century old and the stories that he was drawing on are much older than that. Um, and this was the one that really sort of caught my imagination. It's a story of a merchant traveler um, in Tokyo, in, in the sort of uh, old... Tokyo, but this is of course pre gas lamps, pre uh, any of the kind of modern conveniences. So you have to imagine this uh, rambling, ramshackle old buildings and a lot of vegetation and a lot of darkness, right? I've said this before, but I think we, 
we forget what darkness is like because we're so used to not seeing it, for the, especially those of us who live in towns. The real darkness is a profoundly alienating and unnerving thing. You literally do not know what is around you. So the story um, goes, uh, I have my, a copy here. This is not the, the original, the one that I read as a child. I don't know what happened to that. This is one that I bought uh, years later from, of course, from Kinokunya in, in Tokyo. Um, and uh, and he's talking about the, um, the, the traveler is on the Akasaka Road. Uh, and uh, there's a slope there called Kino Kunizaka. That's what he said. I'm not going to read you the thing because you can read it for yourself, but I'll just tell you the story. So the merchant is on this um, road. It's night, it's dark, and he's sort of spooked and unnerved. And he sees a young, high class, apparently, lady, a woman dressed in traditional clothes, um, wearing a kimono and sobbing into the sleeve of her robe. And he approaches her and he asks her why she's upset and, um, and what the matter is. And she ignores him and continues to cry. And he uh, says, you know, what, what can I do to help? There must be something that I can, I can do to make you feel better. At which point she turns and lifts her head out of her sleeve. And instead of having a face, her face is completely smooth. No eyes, no nose, no mouth. Utterly featureless. And he freaks out, panics, and he runs. Takes off, and he's just like completely spooked. It's late, there's no one around, <clears throat> he doesn't know what to do, he keeps running until he sees a light and there's um, a, a little sort of roadside uh, stall, a, a guy who's selling soba noodles, right, by the side of the road. Um, and he runs up to this guy and he's like, oh my God, I saw this incredible thing. And, and, and he's, he's barely capable of speaking. And the, so, and the noodle seller's like, what? What did you see? What are you talking about? Have you been attacked? Have you been robbed? What, what's the problem? And the guy can barely articulate what he's saying. He's trying to explain it. And then the noodle seller says, was it like this? And he moves his hand over his face, and his face disappears. Hearn's phrase is, it becomes like an egg. And then the light goes out. And that's, all, and that's how the story ends. It doesn't explain to you what happens. The story begins by saying this guy died 30 years ago. Um, we don't know how long after this event he died, whether his death was a consequence of this event or what. All he says is, and then the light went out. And I, as, a, as an adolescent, I read this and I was like, oh my God, that is awesome and weird and, you know, freaky. And I think that, you know, part of what makes it freaky is that double shock, right? that you think you've emerged from the story, kind of. He encounters the woman who's not a woman, freaks out and runs, and he's talking to the noodle seller. And then we get the sort of twist ending, um, and which suggests that, you know, we're not out of the woods, literally, as it turns out. Um, and it's kind of like one of those sequences in a movie when you're in a, <coughs> you realize that you're in a, a, a nightmare, the character's having a, night, a nightmare, but you're in it with the person, so you don't initially know that it's a nightmare, and then there's a moment where the something terrible happens, and then the character wakes up. But then the nightmare continues, and you realize that they haven't really woken up, they're actually still in the nightmare, and they have to wake up again. And it's a very unnerving kind of experience, right? It's very sort of disturbing. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I would say about this is that there are a number of, pro I said that the, the title Mujina is a little um, problematic in some ways. Um, and that's because uh, uh, um, the, the term Mujina 
is used as a kind of generic um, animal term. It's particularly associated with um, with with badgers, a Japanese badger, an anaguma. But it's also associated with tanuki, a kind of uh, Japanese raccoon dog. And with kitsune, foxes, and it may even be associated to a certain extent with the you know now extinct Japanese river otter. Sometimes these stories are associated with water. It makes people think. <clears throat> and there are a couple of versions of these stories, and one of them involves the traveler or whoever you know waking up and finding animal hairs on his clothing, suggesting that the thing that he encountered was. Uh, like a, a tanuki or, or, or something like it. And if you've seen the Studio Ghibli film uh, Pompoko, which is a story about um, tanuki, uh, they use a version of that story almost verbatim, almost exactly the way Hearn tells the story. In this case, I think it's a, I'm trying to remember, it's a policeman, right, who, who gets sort of spooked. Uh, and the, the tanuki, the, the raccoon dogs, enact the entire thing as a way of trying to scare humans away from their habitat. It's a great movie if you haven't seen it, though it's ultimately quite sad. I'm going to warn you of that now. So, um, but some folklorists have said that, you know, uh, Hearn gets it wrong because, in fact, the, the phenomenon that he's talking about is actually called uh, an operabo or, or nupara, nuparabo, uh, which are words that suggest a kind of featureless person. Um, and that this is a sort of separate entity from tanuki or, or uh, mujina or kitsune or any of those kind of animals, right? Now, the term that sort of um, embraces all of these things is yokai, right? The, the, a, a, a word that means what? supernatural entity i mean it really is fairly unspecific it's um a creature and sometimes it's even associated simply with a, a sort of an event um but usually i think the the, the sense is that it's a creature I, i've seen it glossed in in um in in dictionaries as meaning a, like a ghost or a specter which i think is wrong because a ghost in western terms implies a human soul right? And almost always, and I think always, implies a dead person. That's m mostly not what yokai are. They are separate from the human world in some key respect. Um, and uh, sometimes we also, the, the, we might refer to this as a kind of bakemono or, or obake, right? a sort of monster, and particularly a sort of shape-shifting monster, right? A bakemono is particularly associated with things that can change their physical form. But the Nopadabo, you know, is frequently described as a as a person-like entity that has no face. And so now here we get into something that's immediately tricky, because in the Lafcari O'Hearn story, and in several others, we actually kind of get two representations, and it's one of the reasons that that second twist ending pays off really well. Because the first encounter with the with the woman who's weeping, you don't see her face because it's hidden in her sleeve. The implication being that she has no face. And it's only when she lifts her face up that you see that she has no face. Now that's something quite specific. But then when we go and we meet the noodle seller at the end, we're having a conversation with him and he seems to be an ordinary person. So the transformation at the end of the story is doubly unsettling. But it raises this question as to what the Noperabo or the Mujina actually is. Is it somebody with no face? Or is it somebody who can look like somebody who has a face and then doesn't? And in that case, maybe they're not actually a person of any kind at all. And this is where we get the idea that maybe it's a, an animal or, or something else. Now, what's fascinating about this is that there are loads of different stories associated with the, the Mujina or the Noparabo, and they are often very, very similar, but they come from lots of different places. Now, this is one of the things that I find fascinating about Japanese yokai um, culture, for want of a better term, which is that 
they have this sort of oral tradition, narrative, right? And that means that they'll frequently reappear all over the country in slightly different forms. And sometimes they will stray quite dramatically so that people don't even agree on what the thing is called or precisely how it manifests. Um, and this is something that I've, I've alluded to before when talking about some, some Japanese cultural stuff, particularly associated with Shinto, which comes out of the idea that there's no centralized authority which dictates the way that everything is supposed to officially be, right? That, that these things often grow out of local stories, and so they manifest in slightly different ways, and the stories are passed on through oral tradition, and they change a little bit, and sometimes they merge together and become standardized, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they deviate in different ways. The same way that the ghost stories that I grew up with would have different incarnations depending on who was telling the story and what particular traditions or ideas they were drawing on, right? I talk about this in my ghost story, uh, Cold Bath Street and Written Stone Lane, which were based on the novel, based on the stories that I grew up with in Lancashire, in Preston. I'm wearing my Preston shirt, exactly, yes. Um, so, you know, th this idea of the oral tradition of stories that means that they exist in multiple ways. And this is fundamental to Shinto as it was to a lot of old religions before they got standardized, right? When we talk about Greek mythology and stuff, we have a very sort of tidy linear narrative about all the different gods and goddesses and the stories associated with them. But that's because they were written down. A long time ago in ways that then began, became part of Western culture. But that's not how they were originally were at all. They were like wildly different kinds of stories and they were very specific to particular places. And if you look at somebody like, you know, Robert Graves' book on the Greek myths, every aspect of the story that he's telling will come from loads and loads of different permutations of the same narratives. Anyway, I digress. Interesting thing about uh, the Noperabo is that it has been sort of experienced outside Japan. This is an, an, a, a common feature of a couple of, of, of yokai stories or yurei, the ghost stories and, and other kinds of things, is that often there's a tradition of them in Hawaii, which is an interesting thing because, of course, Hawaii has a very large Japanese population. So they've kind of imported some of their sort of traditional cultural elements in ways that seem to manifest these these strange experiences and creatures in this completely separate place. So as I say, there's an inherent flexibility and a kind of shape-shifting quality of the stories themselves, which is really interesting. So let me tell you a couple of others. So in Amori, Amori Prefecture, there's a, a, a similar entity which is called a Zunberabo, and the story there is of a man who is walking through the woods and he's singing to himself as he walks. And then he hears someone else singing the same song, or humming the same song, but better, right? And he stops and he demands to know who's there. And at which point the Zumbarabo or Noperabo appears and says, me, and it's somebody with no face, right? Guy runs off to the neighboring, neighboring village where he meets somebody that he already knows, right? A friend, an acquaintance. And he tells the story about this terrifying experience that he just had in the woods. And at that point, the person who he knows then says, oh, was it like this? And they do the face thing. The guy's face disappears. And of course, our traveler again collapses in a faint. And according to this tradition, dies shortly thereafter. It's not clear whether the death is from some sort of magical experience that comes out of this thing, or whether it's, you know, shock, he has a heart attack, or some sort of stroke or something which subsequently kills him. Though it's interesting that, you know, sometimes these, these stories center on a creature that is essentially playful, and they like spooking people, but that's as far as it goes. But there are a number of these stories that result in the death of the, the person who's being terrorized. There's a similar story from Kumamoto, which talks about a man who is wandering in the mountains at night and he stops at a house, he's, he's, feel, he's lost, he's tired, he was looking for somewhere to rest, he sees a house with a light on and he stops there and has a similar experience. And the yokai here 
this time it's called an opera bon, appears as a sort of faceless old woman. Again, he freaks out when she sort of looks around the door and she has no face. So he takes off and he then encounters a, a young woman. And when he's telling the story, the same thing happens. She does the thing with the, the face and turns it into the, the, the monster. And you see, so again, we're seeing things that initially seem to have no face at all, right? Um, and then in the second part of the story, it's somebody who he, he you know, seems to be a perfectly normal person. In the previous case of the previous one, it's somebody he already knows who then turns out to be one of these things. Now, does that mean the person he knew was one of these things? Or is that one of these things simulating the person who he knows, right? It's not clear, which is part of what makes it unsettling and, and spooky. And also, I would say, it's not entirely clear that what he's experiencing the second time in each of these stories is a different creature. It could be the same creature in disguise who has somehow managed to get to some other place and that's where he meets them. Again, I don't know which is scarier, the idea that the thing can simply reappear somewhere else and freak you out even more, or if there are more of them. There's a story from Kyoto, From there's a, a koi pond near to the uh, Heian-kyo Palace where there was a guy who would go and fish for the koi, the cart, in the pond and his wife told him that he shouldn't do that because the pond was sacred and it was close to an ohaka a, a cemetery where people were, were, were buried and he ignored that story and uh, uh, kept going back and one night he was there and there was there's a, a woman there who tells him he, he shouldn't be fishing in the pond he ignores her carries on fishing and she does the face thing right in this story he freaks out, runs home to his wife, tells her what happened, and his wife says, oh, was it like this? <laughs> so this is genuinely freaky stuff, right? The, the, so again, it's, it's the juxtaposition of the familiar and the unfamiliar, which is so unnerving. It's all fun and, and it's cool and it's interesting, but I think it's worth asking why the image of the faceless person is so unsettling. And the word that comes to mind when we think about how odd this kind of feeling is, the presentation of somebody with no face, and the word that comes to mind to me is uncanny. This is a loaded term in literary analysis. Uh, because it's one of those words that unless you're a Geordie, it really only exists in its negative form, right? We talk about the uncanny. We don't tend to talk about the canny. I mean, we use the word canny to describe somebody as being sort of uh, clever or sophisticated, but that's not the same, right, uh, as the uncanny, which is not, not clever or sophisticated. It means unsettling or strange, as if something unreasonable or strange or mysterious quasi-spiritual has taken place. This is what we, we mean by the uncanny. And it generates, I think, a sense of alienation and revulsion, which is not just about things not being right. Now, this is the way that Freud uses the term, right? Freud's notion of the uncanny fastens very specifically on things that look like humans but aren't. Freud particularly is fascinated by things which create this undercurrent of creepiness because they look human, kind of. There's something slightly unsettling about them because they are in certain respects like humans but are actually not like humans, right? And, and part of it is about forcing you to question the humanity of the thing that you're looking at and, by extension, your own humanity. So one of the things that, that, that Freud talks about, for example, is doppelgangers, things that look exactly like you, right? Or two people, even twins can be a little, uh, identical twins can be uncanny, right? The sense of, of, of two identical people seems to somehow reduce their humanity. I'm not saying that they are in any sense that. Think of those two little girls in the Stanley Kubrick film version of Stephen King's The Shining, where the, the two girls are unsettling because 
you know when you see them that they're not really alive, right? And it's something about the way they look, the way they stand, the way they're dressed the same way. Even before we also see their bodies, there's something unsettling about that sort of creepy duality which reduces their humanity, right? So doppelgangers, specters, other non-human humanoids, right? Things that look human but aren't, which create that sense of strangeness, creepiness, because they seem like they should be familiar and ordinary, but somehow aren't, right? And we see it in waxworks and dolls, right? The sort of standard horror movie idea of the creepy doll, right? Automata, right? Or robots or replicants or any of those kind of things that you see in modern movies. Other things that somehow disrupt common humanity. I would add even masks can, be, can have the same effect or things that are actually human but look kind of like they're not, like clowns, right? Think of the way that clown makeup somehow problematizes the humanity of the character in ways that make it easy for them to turn into images of horror rather than images of comedy, right? Things whose humanity is disrupted by their failure to be fully convincing as People. Now, one of the ways that you know we see this treat discussed a lot is in the so-called uncanny valley, which people talk about a lot in in digital gaming, in, in computer games and such. The attempt, or in or in uh, the creation of <coughs> uh, what would we call them? Um, those sort of uh, artificial people, sort of robots, you know, that work in shops and things that are designed to look like people but kind of don't, right? And, and the, the uncanny valley is that sense that, you know, something that looks kind of human, a little bit sort of human, is engaging, right? So if you have like a stuffed animal, a soft toy, that has sort of quasi-human features, right? Like a, a stuffed rabbit doesn't really look like a rabbit. It looks like a sort of humanized version of a rabbit. But there's a point at which that sort of proximity to humanity gets unsettlingly close to actual humanity. And that's where we encounter the dip into the, uh, into the uncanny valley, where yes, we're comfortable with it, yes, we're comfortable, but now it's getting a little bit too close to human beings and that's where the uncanny experience drops off and we become alienated from the thing itself, right? So, you know, in computer games, people are constantly trying to create CGI characters that look entirely real because when they don't look real, it's not just that they don't look real, it's not just that they look fake, it's that there's something a little bit off-putting about them, something that we don't like that we have a sort of visceral gut response to, to seeing this thing that is and is not human. The result is a sort of jarring juxtaposition of the familiar and the unfamiliar, the real and the unreal, the living and the dead, the human and the monstrous. And that's what I think is at the heart of these Nopadabo stories. What results is a kind of anxiety crisis in which the self, our self, is momentarily unraveled. Perhaps part of the horror comes from a sudden feeling that we too are somehow not we assumed ourselves to be. People are somehow reduced to machines or to other or are otherwise made strange or foreign or alien or hostile even to ourselves. And, and, and you, I'm not going to go into a lot of this, but you can look into what Chris David talks about, about the abject and that sense of something that is exposed that is somehow in between the subject and the object, our sense of self and something that is clearly not us, and that these kind of uncanny experiences somehow disrupt this in ways that we find unsettling, troubling. Now the other thing that I wanted to say is that this, there's something very particularly Japanese about this particular story and the way that it works and I want to complicate it a little bit, right? Um, because I think for foreigners who were first reading Lafcadio Hearn's transcription of this story, I'm sure it tapped into fears, assumptions, some of them frankly racist, about the inherent foreignness and inscrutability about 
people from the Far East, right? About Asians and particularly about their associations with Japanese people. And I say racist because at the core, these ideas are premised on the sneaking suspicion that people who don't look and sound exactly like us, us being Western people, people whose culture and behavior is different from ours, are somehow not fully human, not the way we are, right? That's what I mean about it being racist. Um, and this is one of those sneaky ideas which gets sort of respectabilized in certain kinds of, of discourse. I was, I was listening to some idiot on uh, YouTube talking about the problems with Japanese rock music. And at one point he casually says, well, you know, uh, the, the, the thing is Japanese people are not creative. That, that They know how to imitate, but they don't know how to create. What a load of bollocks. The entire population, really, really. And, it's like, and, and this is somewhat one of those, those ideas which is sort of, the sheer appallingness of it has been dulled by its familiarity. I've been hearing ideas like that since the 80s. People were always saying things like that. Oh, the Japanese are great uh, imitators, but, they, but they're not innovators. What a load of crap. And frequently, of course, the people who are complaining about Japanese rock music in these terms prove the point, right, that they're arguing against because it's the very originality of the music which they can't compartmentalize into their notions of what rock music is supposed to be, right? So they fall back on this profoundly problematic idea that somehow, well, it's not real original music, you know, it's somehow, you know, something um, lesser. That these are frequently flawed and circular arguments is obvious, but it may be less apparent that they're based on fundamentally dehumanizing stereotypes, right? The myth of Japanese on originality was around, as I said, when I was living there in the 80s. And, and, this is, and it came out of the West being sort of caught off guard by the sudden surge in the Japanese economy, by its innovation in uh, electronics and technology or in its car industry and, and the way that that was starting to sort of spread out into the rest of the world. And there were all these sort of rhetorical defenses about trying to sort of push back against uh, th these kind of successes. And frequently they came down to this, oh, well, th they're not really originating anything. They're just copying what we do. And it's like, well, apparently not, you know? So some of it is about the repellent idea that Japanese people are somehow all the same, that Westerners can't tell them apart, right? How many times have you heard this? That they all somehow, have, they all have the same colored hair or so on. So rather than acknowledging those Westerners' failure to recognize the nuances of physical appearance, they dehumanize the Japanese person, making them something less than the kinds of people that Western people are familiar with. When anyone begins a sentence with, the Japanese think X, or Japanese people would never Y, you know that whatever follows is going to be bullshit, right? That it's going to be a blanket statement that's designed to make the Western speaker feel better about their own cultural position at the expense of the stereotyped Asian other. And I should say that there is a flip side to this. And the flip side is the praise for or obsessive and uncritical fascination with all things Japanese, which builds on a similar notion of the Oriental exotic, which even though it's positive, grows out of a similarly reductive stereotype which denies Japanese people a full and three-dimensionally complex humanity. That's what I have to say about that. <laughs> okay, so that got a little bit heavy. Um, but I think this is part of what I find fascinating about these stories, that they tap into things that are primal, things that are unsettling, things that are cool, right, and fun, um, but also things that I think speak to a larger um, cultural dynamic, which I think is really interesting to look at. So yeah, yokai are cool, the end. Am I gonna do more of these? I don't know. Um, I'll be honest, I, I was going to do a separate video asking this question, but I don't know if there's any point. Um, I, I, I'm going to be traveling, so I've been sort of, for the last few days, I've been sort of building some videos in advance that I can release over the next few weeks. 
when I don't have as, uh, as easy access to a computer. And, and I'm struggling with the idea of whether to keep the channel going, if I was honest. Um, you know, since I haven't been responding to baby metal songs because there aren't any new baby metal songs, my, the, the audience has got a lot smaller. My subscriptions are about the same, but the audience has got a lot smaller. And I'm conflicted as to whether it's worth continuing, whether there are enough people out there who care. Because often these type things actually take quite a lot of time to prepare. I mean, I just did um, a, a video sort of announcing a bunch of, of Japanese music, um, new singles, new releases, concerts and stuff. And, you know, it's been out for the best part of a week and has like a couple of hundred views. And it took ages to put that thing together and then to edit it and then to re-edit it so that I didn't get tagged for copyright infringement. And I'm starting to wonder whether it's worth it. Because I did this once when I was working. I used to work for a, a, a writing blog site. And I worked for them for like three years, unpaid. Everything I do is unpaid. Let me remind you of that. <laughs> um, and I used to, every week, I would put up a blog post about writing. And then I would respond to the comments. And, and I would when, when it was not my day, I would post comments on other people's stuff. And it took me a while to realize that the audience who was actually looking at this was very, very small. They were loyal and they were interested, but it was a very, very small number of people. And it wasn't selling my books, which was, of course, part of the reason that I was doing that. Um, but also, I started to realize just how much time I was spending thinking about making these blog posts and preparing for it and taking them seriously when people responded to them and so on. And it was hours and hours and hours each week. And I realized that I could have written like two or three books in the same amount of time. And I'm starting to feel the same way about these videos. I've, this channel has been around for a while. I've really only been doing it consistently and regularly um, with any sense of real purpose in the last two years. But I'm beginning to wonder if um, and I, I, you know, I raised a similar question about six months ago, and then I decided I was going to finish the Baby Metal album and do some more stuff. And I understand that not everybody who watches this channel is going to be interested in Shakespeare or interested in my own creative writing. I, I'm a little more confused by the people who are like, I'm into this band, but I, and I have absolutely no interest in any of these other bands. But I just don't know. I, I understand. I know that I have that there are people out there who will watch these videos. Um, a lot and uh, and respond and like them and are very supportive and I really really appreciate those people but I'm wondering if it's maybe taking up too much of my headspace so I will think about that and um, and maybe we'll do more of these and maybe we won't anyway okay I'm gonna stop at that and I may finish up cutting most of that last section so anyway all right uh, for now that's it I'm gonna quit at least this, and uh, hopefully I will talk to you soon. Cheers. As, uh, and, you know, as ever, feel free to voice your opinion either on any of this, right? Any of the, the, the actual content that I was talking about or my mini angsty rant at the end. Um, and uh, I would be happy to hear from people. Uh, I'll, as ever, check out my Patreon page and so on and so on. Thank you. Bye.